Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vegas Legal Magazine podcast. I'm Mark Fierro with Vegas Legal Magazine publisher Tyler Morgan. Joining us, Fierro Communications Vice President Jeff Haney. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our guest today uh, focuses on our look, a big part of our careers, the way that we present. Are we up for the job, fast on our feet, the team for the job? Our guest today is considered by many to be the top plastic surgeon in Las Vegas, one of the best in the Western United States. You will learn that Dr. Julio Garcia is more than a surgeon. He's a student of art, student of beauty, and an expert in bringing out the best in the way that we look, with the way that we present to the world every day. Dr. Julio Garcia, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Mark. Great to have you back. So one of the things that you're noted for is having a pretty light touch. I had a client and it took me a bunch of times to get it out of her that she went to you. I thought she just had a really great vacation. So you are kind of a minimalist. <laughs> you know, I, I am. Uh, I, um, what My goal is to get the person uh, looking and feeling happier uh, with the least amount. Uh, you can always do more. You can't always do less. So, you know, I try to keep it, you know, dialed in so the person, A, it's not a huge financial burden for them and gives them the result uh, that they want. And not, you know, surgery. I'm a surgeon. Don't get me wrong. I love to operate. At the same time, there's a time and a place for everything. And one of the things that's happened in the last 15, you know, 18 years is the desire for non-surgical interventions has, grown, has just exploded from you know devices to melt fat to injections and fillers and this and that and i totally you know understand that uh, concept because you don't want to leave the person looking abnormal so if i can get them happy with some fillers and a little bit of botox or disport or one of those products you know i always say hey let's try this first if if that's not enough we can you know move it up but you know once you do something surgically uh, you, it's hard to undo <laughs> So you got to, you know, pace yourself. And I'd rather, you know, do a little bit at a time, even with surgery. You know, if I don't like to pull people very tight. Um, I'd rather do a little small touch up at a year to tighten them up a little bit more. But, you know, the last thing I want my patients to do is go to a cocktail party and have people stare at it and go, oh, my gosh, or what did he do? You know, he looks different. Well, the goal is exactly what you said, is you want to look rested. You want to look thinner. Uh, it's probably the most common thing I get from men. How can I, you know, what, what can I do to my face to make myself look thinner, thinner and younger? It's got to be pretty tough in Las Vegas of all places, like one of the more vain cities. It, it certainly is. I'll tell you, uh, vanity here is a problem. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, when I was in uh, Chicago where I trained, uh, average girl we were doing breast augmentation on was five foot two, 140 pounds, and she was getting a 280 cc implant. Girls here. 5'2", 115, getting 450 cc implants. So it's this is just like those ads on the strip say, the biggest and the smallest of what the world offers. You know, we have a very unique scenario here, which is interesting because when you look at what is being done and a lot of the entertainers in town uh, and, this, you know, people that work on a strip, there's a lot of pressure on them to look a certain way. But that that look is changing. I mean, it's drastically changing. And a lot of these people are going to have certain things on board that they may not want in a couple of years. And now it's, you know, how do we do this? How do we undo it? Uh, you know, for, you know, it's funny because the perception is that women that do, you know, porno have huge breasts and blah, blah, blah. And they did for a long, long time. But if you look at what's in that industry now, most of those girls don't have breast augmentations anymore. Mm -hmm. They're natural. And let me tell you, that's where it's gone. And it's going to take a while for that to change, especially here in Vegas or Southern Cal, you know, where you have less clothing on. So it, uh, that's part of the, my hurdle when I meet these people. You know, how do you, how do you limit what they're going to do? And I'm one of the, I would say probably one of the few that says, look, I'm not going to go bigger than this size. You want it bigger, you can go get it done. But, you know, I measure them. I go, look, this is what I can do. If I go, if you go bigger, uh, it's not going to be good. And I tell them at the same time, if they go too small, it's not going to be enough. So you got to find that, you know, that Goldie 
lax kind of mentality with everybody. And that's a challenge in this town, for sure. It's funny, it's like the last couple of decades, everybody wanted to look fake, and now moving forward, people are like, <laughs> wanting to start to look normal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, you're absolutely right. Couldn't say, couldn't makes, say that makes for myself. Good career growth, that's good. Yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> good so for me. Right? Yeah. What, what are some of the other top examples of procedures that some people may have done and then later regret it? Oh, um, well, let's take the first one that we were just talking about, uh, large breast implants. Um, you put in a large breast implant, that girl's a double D or triple D. Uh, a few years later, you know, she gets married, has a couple kids, doesn't want them that big anymore. Um, this is not like changing your shirt. You know, now you've taken tissue, you've stretched it out, and now you've got to do, you put in a smaller implant, and now you've got to do a breast lift with significantly more scars. And that's an emotional hurdle that sometimes can't be overgrown. So that, you know, that's one thing. Uh, in terms of, you know, rhinoplasties, no, no surgeries, you know, trying to st strive for one of those noses that you see on an actress in a magazine that's been photoshopped. Uh, sometimes what looks good on a 16 year old doesn't look good on a 35 year old. So they got that little, you know, nose, it looks like it's the little kids. Um, that, you know, I think, uh, Overfilling uh, lips is a cute, common problem. See that everywhere, right? Just you know, it's everywhere. sad. I mean, the lower lip should be 60% of the total volume and the upper lip 40. And somehow these women think that their upper lip and lower lip should be the same size. That's a problem. Now, luckily, in that case, two, three months, it's gone. Unless you're one of these, you know, uh, guys that puts in firm implants and they have fake little things you can slip into your lips that are permanent mm. and mm. then um, you got to take them out later and those presents different problems are there any procedures that would sort of surprise people to learn that they're more common than they think um well i think that's that's a hard question to answer because the people are so enamored with plastic surgery and changing people's you know appearance that they're very in tune with that i mean they they come in and they you know they tell you everything what they know is going out there so i i deal with a very different patient patient now than i did 30 years ago when i first started working here uh, they were very different people back then now they're coming and telling me what what i should do you know 30 years ago they were asking me what should i do so that is fine, you know, except that when you are getting your information from Google, from Dr. Google, a lot of stuff on Google or Facebook is not the real deal. And then they go get it done in Mexico or some other foreign country and they have a complication. And then, you know, how do you deal with that? Um, you know, probably the biggest, you know, issue, you know, lately is these Brazilian butt lists, which is an interesting term for injecting fat into your buttocks to make them bigger. Um, you know, it's a crazy thing to do personally. I, I just don't like those unnatural looking buttocks because when you see them walk, those butts move in a direction that I don't per perceive as normal. <laughs> um, they just don't move the way muscles would move. I always just wanted like these women with these just like Kim Kardashian yeah. butts, like how do they even sit on a toilet? <laughs> <laughs> run away, run well, away. Well, they're, they're just, they're enormous. It's funny you said that. You know? something, I, I think it was on Facebook a couple of days ago that someone had made a custom toilet seat and it was bigger. <laughs> it was for someone that was yeah. obese, but they said, this must be the so-and-so's <laughs> bat because this thing was, had the normal hole, but then it had this kind of like fountain around it. That's funny. <laughs> but it's, you know, when you have it done, you can't lay flat on your back for like four to six weeks Lord, so, uh, it's crazy and there's what, been deaths what's the new big thing is there i remember a few years ago everything was about that tuck behind the ear thing mm -hmm. that kind of changed the whole lower face what's what's going on you know i mean there are lesser uh involved procedures there's some uh, companies that produce these little threads that have a uh, synthetic cone underneath and they'll put them underneath the skin and pull them uh, so you're not cutting any skin out, but you're trying to move the tissues underneath. Huh. For a very small segment of the population, that works well. The problem is that it's like, you know, when, if, when I take my face and I do this, 
will that cheek look different? Yeah, but then I've got a pleat here. So if you do that on someone who's a little bit older or looser, you're not going to give them the result they want because now they got to wear their hair long in front to hide this pleat, you know, that I've just created there. So uh, that's where the challenge comes in because some people are too young and want a lot. Some people are older and don't and want very little, and it, uh, sometimes a little isn't enough for them. And and that, you know, um, I always tell them. I think I've told you this story before. Is you know, the definition of doctors is, is not healer, it's teacher. It, you know, that's where the word comes from. And that's what we spend a lot of time, you know, on our initial consultations with is, is, okay, what bothers you? And I'll give you some options, but I never try. I mean, I made that mistake 30 some years ago. I always ask, what's your prime number one problem? I don't tell them, I just listen to them. And there's occasions where someone will say, well, you know, I, my neck bothers me and my nose. And I go, well, we can do this and we can do that. She go, and then they say, well, should I do a facelift? I go, well, do you want a facelift? She, they go, well, I don't really know. I'm like, well, if you don't really know, guess what? We're not doing it. Because if you don't know what you want, uh, you know, how do you go to a supermarket or a store or anything, buy something? So, you know, you... They, they list what they what bothers them in, in order. And I say, we can dis do this, we cannot do that. Um, you know, and that's a, that's a happier patient, I think, that requests, has a problem, makes a request, and then that request is service. I think if you start stretching, well, like there's plastic surgeons in town and around the country that say, well, you know, I can't just do a facelift on you. I've got to do your foreheads and your eyes. And, and, and before you know it, you know, it's a huge operation, but they say, "Well, oh, that to be aesthetically pleasing, you know, we, we need to balance the whole face." Well, dude, it's not your face; it's their <laughs> face. And if they want something lesser, you know, that prime example of that is is men. Men typically won't get a full facelift; they'll just get their necks done because that neck looseness makes them look older and saggy, and sometimes, you know, just just not not the way they want. You know, what the guys want is a tight neck and a good jawline. They really don't care about their cheeks as much as women do. Women are, you know, very cognizant of other things. So, you know, most of the time when, when you see a male, they're going to get a neck lift or a facelift, uh, for sure. Much more common. We were talking and, uh, one of the, one of the things that you said uh, at that time, last time we spoke, that had great promise was stem cell, the possibility. And you said, you know, it's out there. It's probably you're going to have. What is going on with stem cell? Well, um, stem cells of all different kinds and, and flavors have really blown up in the last, you know, six, seven years. Um, initially, they were using bone marrow uh, sources for stem cells and then fat derived or adipose derived stem cells. Uh, the problem is still to this day that the, the ingredients that are in that tissue that's harvested, that liquid, is not pure stem cells. It's mixed with a bunch of things, which is not necessarily bad. But the misconception is that when you take those cells, you can inject them into something and create what needs to be filled. So if you get a torn cartilage, it's going to turn into cartilage. And that particular stem cell you inject does not have that capability. It has to, what it's there is to signal the tissues that are there to get the dormant cells to work. So it's blown up, um, you know, it's still being done all over, uh, umbilical cord sources now for stem cells and mesenchymal cells or MSCs are, are out there. Um, you know, there's been a recent explosion of things called peptides, which are small proteins that are, that we can use for a lot of different things. And so, you know, the 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 menu is much broader than it was, you know, when we first talked. I mean, back then there was adipose derived, bone derived, and that was pretty much it. You know, now you have umbilical cord, and in that umbilical cord, there's different products depending on what you want to do, and the peptides. Geez, Louise, I know a lab in or a pharmacy in the States that I think they produce 70 different peptides. Oh, Lord. It's, uh, and they can treat a lot of things. So, you know, the medical care is changing. It's not, um, 
you know, there's some hard hurdles because the drug companies don't like certain of these things because they eliminate the need for certain things. <laughs> so um, that's always a challenge. But that's that's what I thrive on is just constantly, you know, teaching myself more stuff that I can do and see if that is going to fit into a niche of something that I used to do and be less invasive um, and potentially safer uh, and more gratifying for the patients. So it, um, and that's ultimately, you know, what I like to do is I like to have happy people, whether I do it with a scalpel or a needle from an injection or a peptide or a stem cell, you know, I don't care what the, the route is. If I can get them happy and feeling better, um, that's the gig. That's what I'm after. Um, I just want them smiling, you know, when they leave. And I want them to remember me. Because uh, that's, that's the biggest source of my continued patience is other patients. Are there, are there any new, like, lifestyle factors that people should consider? I mean, we all know smoking ages you. Drinking is obviously going to break your body yeah. down. Are there any other lifestyle factors that we're finding no. lately that are contributing to maybe? Um, it's a great question. And luckily for all of us, the answer to that is yes. Oh. Um, sometimes you find these things just by, by sheer accident. And um, we were talking before the show uh, about how there are certain people, you know, and specifically in this realm, men, that want to have a certain appearance versus another. You know, they want to be bigger, stronger, thicker, whatever. And, um, you know, sometimes they'll take certain things to amplify their size. Just about everything you do chemical-wise to amplify your size or amplify your, your size is going to have a detriment because they will create certain things, certain chemicals in your body that's called an mTOR, which makes you grow muscle faster. Now, it sounds very attractive, but the problem is that as soon as you amp up mTOR, you start shortening your life, your lifespan. So one of the interesting things that, you know, I tell my patients and I do myself is I intermittently fast. Now, that doesn't mean that I fast for two days a week and then eat the others. I only eat within a six to eight hour window in 24 hours. What that does is it causes your body to go into a preservation state where it wants to do something called apoptosis, which is to kill the cells that are non-viable. It wants to trash out and it's going to stimulate your stem cells to be better. So you'll hear about products that increase your mitochondria. Mitochondria is huge. Uh, I'm actually getting ready to, to submit a grant for, to do some research on on mitochondrial strengthening because there's a lot of illnesses out there that are involved with that. So you take something like you see all these supplements that are on the news or on Facebook or Google that say, hey, do this and you'll have more energy when you go to work out. And many of those do work. Um, we have a lot of what's termed mitochondrial dysfunction in the United States. You know, we end up beating our bodies up, eating poorly. Um, you know, I try to eat as much organic you know, food as I can. Um, I don't try, you know, I try to avoid, uh, if I'm going to use oils, it's not canola oil and the traditional stuff. You know, I use coconut oil or safflower or, or a peanut. Um, just, you have to educate yourself in doing that. Uh, and it's funny because this intermittent fasting, um, it's, it was really kind of took off with the Israeli Mossad, the secret, you know, their secret guys. And that, they were all forced to be that way because they said, listen, you may be in a situation where you have to function, you don't have food, you gotta get used to this. And um, that's where it really started to grow. Uh, and um, the guy who, who came up with it, uh, Ori Hoffmeiler, he wrote a book on it. And I read that and I go, man, this is dead on. Which correlates with uh, what a guy down in Southern California did, uh, a guy named Longo, about intermittent fasting by using just fluids instead of, you know, solid food for periods of time. And it's amazing how doing that little bit will get your own stem cells to live longer. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one thing that surprised me. We were talking about, you know, the adipose or fat derived stem cells. I've taken that stuff out of people in their 20s and people in their 70s. And I'm amazed, you know, those 
young 20 some year olds that are coming in with an injury but they beat themselves up because they're you know working out real hard they party hard you know we we have a counter that would count the, the cells and i'm like man these are really no low numbers for someone in their 20s and i get a 70 year old that took care of herself and her numbers are off the off oh, the chart that's interesting so it's you know it, it's uh, you got to you know read about it teach yourself uh but yeah i think i think intermittent fasting is a great way to do it um you know it's it it helps you mobilize certain things uh better and you know this is mostly about mitochondria and energy you know we're going to we used to say we were going to rust we we're going to you know oxidize to death and yeah that's probably true we, we do cause a lot of inflammation in our body and we go through that but mitochondria gets you through the day and if you aren't don't have enough healthy mitochondria that's when you feel tired you know prematurely during the day man i'm really dragging today you know and and uh there's a lot of things that people out there there's uh, win hoff who he's a big guy about you know breathing exercises and getting, going from hot to cold um he's big on that there's uh you know heart rate variability monitors that a lot of guys are wearing in the morning and that tells them okay listen your heart rate is this right in bed you shouldn't work out today or you know you're you're good to go you're gonna have a great day because you know you're energized you're, you're healed so uh there's even some massages you can do that stimulate certain chakras in your body to decrease your stress level so you can work out harder um, one of the biggest fallacies is you know you sometimes you get to the gym and you have a bad day because you didn't lift as much. Well, the reality is most likely it's your nervous system that you burned down because you went too many days in a row and your nervous system didn't heal and the nervous system has to fire for that muscle to function. And it's it's the American way, right? Just go to the gym five, six days a week. And no, it's keep lifting heavier. You got so, <laughs> along those lines, do you run into many guys, I, I guess men or women, but probably men in particular, who get mixed up with uh, like uh, black market supplements or substances oh. and get messed up that way and need yeah. to need to get straightened out. And yeah. It, what are the dangers of, of those? Well, the dangers number one uh, is the stuff you're buying. You're buying, uh, you know, off label or in the dark side. You don't know if it's really that or, or not. You know, very often, just like you know, the meth coming in from you know Mexico is tainted with fentanyl. Uh, and people die. Uh, it's a lot of what is done with these other things, you know, that they get, you know, black uh, black ops, black list situation. So the problem I've had in treating some of those, excuse me, people, because I, I do some hormone replacement for individuals, um, the longer they're on those products without coming off, the longer the problems are. Uh, for example, there's a lot of soldiers that were overseas for extended periods of time, you know, 12, 18 months. And uh, it's very common for them to use artificial, you know, drugs to get them through. Um, and I would tell them, I said, how long were you on it? Six months? Okay, it's going to take me 18 months to get you back. Um, and this is not something new. This is something that you know the nazis were using during world war ii they all Mass, were huge, amphetamine, amphetamine, amphetamine and anabolics yeah. mm. they were the first to do oral antibiotics oral antibiotics mm. so um there's a huge black market yes absolutely uh there are places online you can buy things that are listed as for research only and of course it gets to your house and it gets injected into your butt or you know they got a buddy who's a vet and sell some stuff Oops. from the vet because vets um, have access to that. And it's funny because <laughs> vets are doing stem cell therapy to, the, to their, you know, their people's uh, pets with great results, actually. But that was going to say, yeah. they're, because they don't have those constraints, they can do a little bit more experimentation. Mm -hmm. A lot yeah. of big advances come out of veterinary care, particularly <clears throat> in areas of cancer. Yeah. You mentioned uh, stress, the impact of stress. So this is the end of May. Um, and uh, within the last 10 days, there's a great article in the New York Times, and it was so clear, it was so concise, and one of the things that it said is, is uh, so, you know, we're constantly bombarded, and we, our immune system is always out there, you know, it's yeah. just like this whole field of police that are out there, and they're working around us. They said, but imagine for a second 
they're being chased by a lion across the plains on the savannah. This is where we all started out, right? Yeah. You think your immune system is working then? No, it's shut down. You're the most important thing, stay out of the lion, right? right? Well, when you're in a state of stress, your immune system is shut down. Shut down. Exactly. It's just, and it's not but it's not because you've just run it down. Your body says this is more important. This thing, he thinks he's about to get shot or stabbed or run over or the world's against him. The body turns off and focuses on that perceived threat that may not be real at all, right? Right, right. and it's not always physical because You'll take someone, you know, who, for example, gets some bad news or, you know, something goes wrong at work and they'll get really sullen and, you know, dark and they just get sad and getting them out of that is very difficult um, because, you know, again, it's the nervous system. It, it's controlling everything. And if you let that happen, um, it's a challenge to fight it back. You know, it doesn't always have to be physical. You know, a lot of the stress that we deal with, you know, here in the States especially, is locational stress, your job, your loved ones, or lack of, you know, money, you know, whatever. You know, it's a million different things. But it's that little thing that goes off in your body says, okay, stress level's going high right now. It doesn't know. Did you, were you attacked by someone with a gun and a knife? Or do you just have a fight with your girlfriend? It's about the same kind of chemical release. Mm -hmm. So how do you control it? And, um, you know, things like getting a good environment in your home, you know, uh, t turning down the temperature a little bit when you're at nighttime so you want to sleep in a cold environment, you know, no stimulation, try to get all the electronics out of your bedroom as much as you, you can. Uh, I meditate every morning, you know, minimum t 12 minutes. Sometimes I go 48 depending on... If I'm anticipating a bad day, I go for at least half an hour. Uh, and, you know, it's that kind of stuff that, um, for example, for a while there I was doing flotation tanks, similar kind of technology that I'm using now. But the first two or three, you know, floats, I was like, man, I couldn't relax. I was like, what's this? This is like, but then it teaches you to get into that zone where you would be in that water for 55 minutes and you'd think it was two minutes because your mind is, you know, just goes and goes and goes and goes. And that's the problem that we need to allow us to decompress every day. You know, well, what do we do? No, we get up, you know, you just go do something, you know, you get your routine going. Okay, get my coffee. I'm going to do this, get my, you know, this, and then just go, go, go. And you don't have a chance to relax and let your nervous system heal. I mean, um, you know, the guy that uh, owns the gym that I go to train, he writes all my routines out. You know, he gives me six weeks at a time. And, you know, a couple months ago, I, I broke pattern. and I said, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to do what I want to do. And I was doing one particular exercise. I was deadlifting five times a week and uh, trying to, to get to my, you know, my body would adapt. And, you know, after, you know, I thought it was going to go great, did four and a half weeks, and then I just crashed. My nervous system was shot. And he saw me, and he says, yeah, you haven't been doing my routine. I go, yeah, I know. I was trying something different. And he goes, you know, what's going on? I said, man, I just can't get through a workout. He says, well, yeah, your nervous system's, you know, burnt. So I said, get out of here. Don't come back for a week. And that's what I did. He gave me a new routine, and, you know, different things, different days. And, uh, you know, I can't, I can't train the way I used to when I was 21, you know, I'm going to be 62 here shortly. And I still think I can do a lot of stuff. I still do, but I am you know, not 21 years old. I got to be real about this. So. Yeah. Maybe try it twice a week with deadlifting. That's a pretty yeah. intense uh, exercise. That's whole body lift. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's great exercise, but yeah, it'll burn you. <laughs> it'll burn you for sure. The, uh, there, there's a great book years ago, uh, the, um, the four hour marathon, that training for the four hour marathon. And they said, uh, you know, they broke down every day of the week. This day is a, you know, the coast day. This day is a sprint and a walk day, you know, 100 yard, 100 yard, back to back. And then they said the only day that's immutable is the rest day. Because yeah. if you don't do that, oh. when you get your injury, that'll take that race off the calendar. Yeah. You won't do it at all. And it's, it's something, you know, I have a friend of mine, a very good friend, um, he's a triathlete, and he's uh, just a little bit younger than I am, and he's, he's got it dialed in. 
he's got a guy who's a nutritionist, tells him how to do it. He's got the, the heart rate variability thing. Uh, and this guy's a beast. He is just a beast. But you got to, you have to realize that that's part of, of what we should be doing to some degree, as long as you don't overdo it. He's got his Sundays and sometimes half a day on Saturday. He says, you know what? I can't. I'm not going to go swim today. I'm not going to go run. Um, and, but the goal is you still got to do what you love to do, whether it's golf, working out, lifting, running, just find it, you know, find your gig and do it. Um, you just don't necessarily have to go 120% every single time. Right. <laughs> it actually, you know, it's been shown, uh, in a lot of studies where if you try to, you know, lift that, you know, 95% weight all the time, you're not going to make progress. So as frustrating as it is for me to leave the gym at times with the program he writes for me, um, I go, man, I could have done more. He goes, no, get out of here. Because he knows. I mean, he's been coaching for, you know, geez, 40 some years, pro athletes and, you know, uh, stuff like that. And he, you got to know when to walk away because you got to heal. And if you're not taking juice, then you got to heal on your own. And that's a big, that's a much bigger gig. I mean, my wife makes fun of me how many pills and powders I take every day. I go, just leave, leave me alone. I need, I need these. If nothing else, they may not work, but they, I think they do. So I'll let me take that's them. good enough. <laughs> <'Cause> that's, <you laughs> know. I had a Taekwondo instructor, lifelong, lifelong uh, martial artist. Uh, he uh, grew up in Korea when the Japanese were. Uh, still occupying Korea and so they had to do all of their arts as dances he's a little right. kid they dress him up in dresses and stuff and well he he gets up there and he's in his mid 40s and he's benching just under 500 yeah and that's a lot, we man. all all these people would stand around because you start messing around with 500 pound weights if something goes wrong one guy's not going to fix it right and um next week I would see him and he was doing substantially less and less and less and less I said, Sabo Nim, what happened to the big heavy weights? He goes, oh, that's my birthday. He goes, from my birthday on, I go, he pyramid down and then pyramid back up. And wherever he got to that birthday, that was what he was going to be able to lift that year. And um, as a result, he looked like he was a big bottle of steroids, but he was on nothing except right. eating everything natural right. from Korean foods right. that he could get his hands on. Do vegetarians have any sort of advantage? You get to see all people all You know, I mean, uh, there's a lot of vegetarian bodybuilders, a lot of vegetarian athletes out there now. Um, they just, as cognizant as I am and, and all of us should be in terms of our nutrition, uh, vegans, you know, obviously the difference between vegetarians and vegans, but if you're pure vegan, if you're like a real diet and wood vegan, that's gonna be real hard. It's hard. And you have to train yourself and you have to be regimented because you're gonna have to be more exact than a vegetarian who can cheat a little bit. Uh, so you, anyone can do it. Now, is it, is it the right thing? Well, I think what we're finding, um, uh, is that some people respond better to vegan than others. And, you know, that's where the epigenome that you can get tested, you know, with when you do your DNA testing. Um, some of these are pretty small entities where, you know, it's a small company, they'll send you back, you know, 12 or 13 of your chromosomes and they'll tell you what it is. There's some other ones that are more advanced and give you a lot more information. And the uh, epigenome is basically the cover that controls that particular DNA strand. So if you have mutations there, and it's usually anywhere from one to three pieces that will be affected, it can affect you. So, you know, I just got tested about six months ago. Just, I had been tested before and I went to this big company that did it. And so we're going through that and he goes, uh, yeah, you, you metabolize caffeine very quickly. I go, yeah, I knew that. <laughs> mm -hmm. I drink a lot of coffee, you know. And um, but it's funny, you know. They start reading through those little genetic markers, uh, the epigenetic things that we can honestly control to a great degree. Um, and you find out that you, you know, I could do things that you know others couldn't, and others can do things that I can't because genetics. Now. You can modify that by taking supplements and avoiding certain things. Uh, you know, the, the, the best known epigenetic problem is 
people born with spina bifida that the women were told to take folate. They weren't taking enough folate. Mm -hmm. They came out with spina bifida. That was the first epigenetic DNA problem identified. So that's B, B complex. Yeah, B, it's folate, yeah. And uh, so now they put it in all the baby you know, formula and stuff. So, you know, it, it is, um, we're, the technology is growing so much that we really almost don't have an excuse to be unhealthy. If you go f look for it, they'll tell you how to fix it. Now the question is, how are you going to do it? And I'll be the first to say, you know, I fall off the wagon sometimes. I go, man, and sometimes I want, you know, that piece of, you know, ice cream and, and a brownie, you know, because my grandson's right there and he's having it. He goes, come on, Poppy, you, you have it. I go, Ooh. you know, but, in, and you, listen, you got to do it once in a while. But is, you know, it's like everything else, you know, you're only as good as your next day. So you just get up. And do it again. Do it better. It's the great Speaking American problem. Moderation. That's right. That's right. <laughs> moderation. Whoever heard it's, of that? Uh, right. Not What's next either. on the agenda? I know you're a lifelong learner. That's one of the things I find so fascinating yeah. by you, about you is that you've always got your hand in it. Well, uh, in order to go forward, sometimes you go back. So uh, along with all that other stuff we talked about, um, I'm being taught Chinese medicine. And I'm, so I can offer to myself and to my patients um, different options for their health. Um, and it's been very interesting um, for me to learn that stuff because, you know, you, you read, I read it through it the first time. I go, man, this, this can't be, you know, this can't be. But at the same time, these guys have been doing it for thousands of years, right? So I said, well, you know, the usual story that guys do. I said, well, I'll try it, you know, and so I did. And yeah, it's better. So the problem is that, you know, it's not for everybody. You know, true Chinese medicine is not cheap. I mean, when you go get legit supplements, it is not cheap. But if it's going to make you function like a Ferrari instead of a beat up, you know, Camry, it's going to be a different thing. So, uh, yeah, I mean, so I'm always, you know, looking for something new. And that was old. But new to me, and um, I, I have fun learning about it. I have fun giving it to my patients, and um, you know they're they're as skeptical when I first start telling them what to do as as I was when I started. And then sooner or later, you say, you know what, this is uh, this is working. There's something here. Yeah. yeah. So. How does somebody get started with you? They go, well, you know what? I, I know he can't do 20 years or 10 years, but I would love to see what he can do. What, 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 how, do they, how do they get started? With you know, I, basically he's come in and, and have a consultation. You know, I, got, I, I need to know their problems. I need to know what their lifestyle is, what they do, what they don't do, what their goals are. And then we, we try to set up a plan. And that might be surgery. It might be injections. It might be nutrition. It might be hormones. It might be peptides. I mean, that's one advantage I have now over what I had, you know, in 1988 when I got here. You know, I got more things to offer, and that allows me a greater variety because otherwise it was the same thing all the time. You know, breast surgery, liposuction, facelift, breast, you know. I think that's what most people just associate a plastic surgeon with. It sounds like you got a lot more going on. Yeah. I'm, do, do you have a hard time sort of getting that that potential patient to sort of get past the fact that, no, I'm not necessarily going to just, like, throw silicone in your body or whatever, come in, there's a lot of different things I can do to help you. Yeah, it, it's certainly, you know, the way I try to be. Um, so what I've kind of done it, to make it a little bit easier, I have two practices in one. I have my cosmetic surgery practice mm -hmm. and then I have my regenerative medicine practice. So depending on what, what their trigger is, they're gonna find. Now, invariably, they're gonna bleed over <laughs> because they say, what else do you do and stuff? So. The patients that come to see me for regenerative medicine, most of them don't even know I'm a plastic surgeon because hmm. they they respond to the the name regenerative medicine. They don't respond to the other. So, and I've only been doing it, you know, since 2013. So, whereas the other stuff's older, so I'm more cemented in that. But yeah, I mean, it's a matter of of diversifying yourself to stay emotionally and brain wise younger. And that's the thing. We got to, you know, if you want to live, for, I don't want to live in a nursing home drooling on myself, you know. And that's why I read everything I can. How do I avoid this? How do I avoid that? You know, what can I take to stop this? You know, is it expensive? You know, 
urine that I'm pouring into my body? Probably, maybe, you know, but. If it's worth it, it's worth it. I'd <laughs> rather have that than the other saying, hey, you should have taken that little vitamin, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And then we, we've talked a lot about what's going on, on in Las Vegas, but I know, you've, I know that you have treated patients from all over the world, really. I was wondering if you could touch upon some of the far-flung locations you've treated patients from. Um, and how do you attract an international clientele like that? that you know, that, those were pure, uh, well, the, the ones from the Middle East, I got from people that knew me in the Middle East, that they wanted to get out of town and have something done surgically and not be around where they came from. Um, but then, you know, a while back when I had my website, um, I used to have this thing where I would allow patients to ask questions of anything. And I've gotten people from Europe from that, from Australia. You know, they, they contact me, they start asking me questions, they go see the doctor in their hometown, they may get a little different, you know, story. They go, why do you think this? I explain it to them. And, um, so yeah, it's, it's been an interesting ride in terms of uh, variations of where they come from um, and um, some crazy people. <laughs> mm -hmm. And with that, we call it a day, the Vegas Legal Magazine podcast. I want to thank you so much, Dr. Thank Julio you. Garcia. Thank Thanks you so much for being on That's today. That's awesome. I love really it. do do appreciate it. An interesting practice. Tyler Morgan, publisher of Vegas Legal Magazine. Jeff Haney, vice president of Fiero Communications, the friendliest PR company in town. Remember to like and share the Vegas Legal Magazine podcast on Facebook. Also catch us on YouTube, iTunes, or my personal favorite, Stitcher. For all of you out there with a story, a story, idea, or an ax to grind, get a hold of Vegas Legal Magazine at 702-222-3476. Reach out, tell us, tell your friends, are out of here.